G'day! Welcome to True Blue History. I'm Adam Bloom. Today's special guest is Joe Hook, Battlefield Guide for Matt McLaughlin Battlefield Tours. And we are talking about the Battles of Bull Corps, where 10,000 Anzacs were lost in the two battles in April and May 1917. Hi, Joe. Thanks for joining us on the show. Thank you. Nice to be here all the way from England. <laughs> no, thank you, Joe. I do appreciate you coming on. And so, Joe, just to basically get into it for our listeners, can you can you give us an overview of the lead up to Bulacor? What was happening in the lead up to Bulacor? Okay, so um, to put it into context, and this is something that I, I'll be telling my passengers, had I been on a tour um, this week going down to Bulacor, um, so I keep repeating what happens in the war so people understand. So the end of 1916, we come to the end of 1916, the Australians and British have gone through the 141 days of the Battle of the Somme. And we go into 1917, which is a very interesting year because globally things are happening. Um, in Russia, they're just starting a revolution that really wouldn't reach its epicenter till October 1917. But in the north of um, Ypres, up at a place called Zeebrugge, the Germans are adopting a policy of unrestricted U-boat warfare. Um, so that is happening. And that, would, that, amongst other things, would eventually bring America into the war in 1917. So all this is happening. In 1916, we've seen the first use of tanks, um, though they're very much still in their infancy. Now, after the Battle of the Somme, the two, um, let's say, ally commanders uh, during the Battle of the Somme, a Field Marshal Haig for the British and a guy called General Joffre for the French. And at the end of 1916, Joffre gets sidelined uh, because of uh, what has been going on down in Verdun um, and because of the Somme. Both of them eventually peter out in 1916 with no solid conclusion our way. And so Joffre is um, usurped or, or um, taking his place as a guy called Georges Nouvelle. Now, Nouvelle is a very much a flamboyant character, quite arrogant. He has been the hero of Verdun. And Nouvelle, in 1917, comes up with a cunning plan. Note my words to Blackadder there. He comes up with a cunning plan. And he goes virtually over Field Marshal Haig's head, Field Marshal Haig being the commander of the British Expeditionary Force. Uh, and he, he, he raises his plan with Lloyd George, who's the British Prime Minister. And the plan, um, to cut a very long story short, is that the French will attack down at a place south of um, where the British line is, a place called Soissons, the Chemin des Dames. But in order for the French to do that, and the British... For the majority of the war, we're all in support of the French offensives. The British have to attack at Arras and consequently at Bulkal. Um, so Nouvelle comes up with this plan, goes to Lloyd George, and Lloyd George is very reticent about using more and more British Empire troops on the battlefield. And knowing that the French are going to undertake the main effort, he agrees to it. Field Marshal Haig is furious, um, but however... He has to support it because he's politically, he's, he's virtually always fighting with one arm behind his back. Um, so the plan is that, as I said, the French will attack in Soissons, uh, down in the south of France, but only once the British have successfully attacked up at Arras. Now, if you look at a map, you have Arras just um, north of the Somme battlefield, but then just south of Arras is Bulkal. And the Australians and the Australian uh, One Anzac Corps and the British 62nd Division, 20, uh, 25th Corps, I think it is off the top of my head, although I possibly am wrong with that numbers. But they will be pulled in as, in support of this main effort up in Arras and Bulkal. And overall, that effort is to stop German troops reinforcing down in the south where the French will eventually attack. Does that make sense? It does, Joe. Yes, it does. So we, we moved to the battle to Bull Corps. And can you just tell the listeners when this attack actually took place? Okay, so the attack would take place uh, in Easter. It, uh, originally, it was um, scheduled to take place on the 10th. But because of 
what happened during the battle that 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 uh, particular phase of it was cancelled um, and there's quite a lot of controversy over it and then eventually the first battle of Fulcourt will take place on the 11th of April um, it is a complete disaster the Australians the fourth Australian division will be pulled out of the line and then will be go back behind the lines over a period of about nearly a month to rehearse and plan and to rehearse for the next phase of Fulcourt, which is the second uh, phase, which takes part in early May. Uh, but what we have to remember that that was April. Today, it's a glorious sunny day. It's still April. At the time, it was snowing. It was Easter Sunday and it was snowing. The, the winter of 1917 was the harshest and worst winter of the war for not only the Australians, but everyone involved. So, Joe, can we, with, with you Doc, just leading that there was snowing, can we get into the guts of what the conditions were like on the battle and now actually get and sink our teeth into the battle? Of course we can. So we have to go to a bit about um, what the Germans were doing at this stage. Now, in the spring of 1917... Uh, or throughout 1916, the Germans had been uh, building this huge impenetrable line known as the Siegfried Stellen, or we know it more commonly as the Hindenburg Line. And that would go all the way down from Arras, all the way down, pass through Bulcourt, and, and eventually would end up uh, uh, south near San Quentin uh, and the San Quentin Canal. Now, there were two reasons for doing this. First of all, this uh, huge a fortified line was supposed to be impenetrable. But the second reason was it allowed the Germans to withdraw and shorten their line. And therefore, they would, could put more troops into that particular part of the line. In doing so, in about February 1917, they began to withdraw. And they withdrew through Bhopal, villages, sort of Bovarcourt, Lagnicourt, uh, Noré. All these villages, they withdrew and leaving behind them a policy, a scorched earth policy, whereby everything was poisoned, booby-trapped, uh, buildings were booby-trapped, uh, the Marie very famously in both Palm was booby-trapped and uh, quite a few of the Australians were killed uh, because of unexploded devices. But they poisoned wells, they destroyed the infrastructure, the roads, the railways. Throughout the winter of 1917, if you read the war diaries, certainly uh, for Fourth Australian Division and for the Division Sport, their main uh, effort that winter was rebuilding that infrastructure. So if you look at the war diaries for Fourth Australian Division on the, um, as well as the fighting following this withdrawal, but um, you'll also read that more rubble was brought up for the roads, how cold the conditions were, bitterly cold conditions. Um, freezing roads, the ground was freezing, water froze up. Um, so very, very difficult. But in the um, overall context, this plan is going up ahead. And for the Australians, the Australians are under um, the command of the Fifth Army. Now, the commander of the Fifth Army is a guy called Goff. And uh, Goff is not liked by a lot of the Australians and quite frankly I can understand why. I did my level best when I was doing my MA to found, find something I would like about him but um, I failed uh, to find anything. Now he's impetuous, he's a bully um, and he bullies his staff officers so the men that do all the planning and the expertise around him so much to the point that I think they think Oh, God, yeah, okay, whatever. We'll do anything just to keep him off our backs and shut him up. So he commands the 5th Army, and that's in south of Arras. Now, north of Arras, oh, sorry, around Arras, it's the 3rd Army, led by a guy called Allenby. And both Allenby and Gough are very much in the line to possibly fight later on in 1917 or to command their armies to fight in 1917 at Ypres. So both of them want to do well in this battle. Allenby has under him the, the Canadians and the Scots. And initially when they attack at Arras on the 9th of uh, April, uh, they do extraordinarily really well. The Canadians up at Vimy Ridge and so on. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail because uh, we'll be talking until next week. Mostly <laughs> <laughs> we'll at some point today. Um, uh, now, Fifth Army, uh, their orders are to only attack if it is seen that the battle further north is going well. So when the uh, messages come down that Arras is proving successful, uh, their plan 
is to attack. Initially, um, they're not going to use artillery. And the reason they're not going to use artillery is because a percentage of the artillery has been sent to Third Army in the north because it's the main effort. But one of the uh, new and innovative technical advances that has been given to GOP is the deployment of 12 tanks. Now, what you have to remember is the tanks are only really six months old. They'd only come onto the battlefield in September 1916, had been very, very ineffective. Uh, how do we fight with these things? They're prone to break down. Temperatures can get up to 50 degrees centigrade within the tank. They have an eight man crew. It's st still not quite understood how we fight with these things. Do they support the infantry? Does the infantry support them? But um, possibly Goff's dilemma is that a lot of his artillery has gone to Third Army in the north. So shall we just risk it and use these new weapons? Um, the initial attack is due to take place on do at dawn on the 10th of April. Um, and the way they are going to attack, they are going to attack with 12 tanks. Four tanks are going to be deployed to 12th Brigade, which is fighting on the left. If you look at a map of Bullocko, is fighting on the left. Uh, and then four tanks will be deployed between 12th Brigade and 4th Brigade, who are fighting on the right. And these really are meant to break down these huge belts of barbed wire. And, um, and then four tanks will deploy, be deployed in support of 5th Brigade. So you have two brigades fighting side by side with a gap really in the middle um but they're fighting over ground which is a re-entrant so a re-entrant um for those who are uh, are not quite sure it means you've virtually got high ground all the way around you and this hindenburg line it runs uh, up the side so up the right hand flank of where the fourth brigade would be attacking in front of them it then runs along the back of bull Corps, but then runs in front of it as well so effectively what the australians are going to be doing with the british 62nd division fighting to their left they're going to be at attacking in a salient so they're going to be attacking into enemy fire which is in front of them to the right of them and to the left of them and because of poor weather conditions prior to the attack are uh, uh, the royal flying corps up in the air who were supposed to be reconnoitering the ground have not been able to carry out full reconnaissance so really um they're going into the into the lion's den in every way shape or form um staff work both uh, uh, I, and I, I talk about the australians more because my clientele is australian but staff work is poor we know birdwood is not in favor of attacking with tanks and without using artillery. And Birdwood, I think, in my opinion, is very weak to command uh, the first Anzac Corps. He's very much of a bit of a yes man. Um, he has stood up to Goff before. He stood up to Goff uh, together with his two IC Brudenell White at Fossiers. So in my opinion, he could have stood his ground here and said, right, this is, we need artillery fire. Um, uh, we're not going to not use artillery. We're not going to put all our reliance on this new weapon, which we're not quite sure how to fight with it. So I think he could have possibly stood his ground and said to Goff, we're not going to attack um, so quickly um, because they'd only been up in the area since sort of like the end of March, beginning of April. Um, we need more time to prepare and we need more artillery fire. Um, but he didn't do this. So uh, basically on that morning, um, you have men that move up to the front line. Now, the front line for them is a railway cutting that runs across the ground. And, and for those of you, and I bet yourself, Adam, you'll be very familiar with that railway cutting. It's still in evidence today. Um, and the ground hasn't changed in 100 years. And it's snowing. There are men lying out on that front line in full fighting order. And they are getting colder and colder. And as you get colder and colder, your limbs stiffen up. Um, the tanks, meanwhile, making their way up in hope, hoping to uh, rendezvous with the infantry awaiting them, have got lost in a snowstorm. They are extremely slow. And as dawn breaks on that morning, there is uh, hurried messages going back and forth because the tanks haven't made it. 
Are the infantry still going to attack? They have no artillery fire whatsoever supporting them. And so on that morning, a message is sent from the 4th Division headquarters to the men lying out on the ground to cancel the attack. However, that message from 4th Division headquarters um, doesn't get sent until the British 2nd, 62nd Division until too late in that morning. And so 62nd Division will deploy their men into the battlefield um, with no support on their right hand flank. And consequently, a lot of the British are killed because of that mistake. Mistakes like this happened throughout the First World War. It happened in Bromel's as well. But um, yeah, it was pretty ineffective staff work. Joe, it sounds like an absolute schmozzle. And just by the sounds of it, the attack, well, it was called off, but it still went ahead. And it, in your opinion, do you actually think the attack should have actually, they should have just said, no, we are not going to attack or the first, so the first battle or, and wait for obviously retraining and getting the artillery and getting the adequate tanks? Do you, do you agree that it shouldn't have gone ahead? I, I, it's a good, it's a really good question. And in an ideal world, yeah, it shouldn't have gone ahead at all. But um, the ch chain of command is not like that. I mean, Goff knows he just can't say, sorry, chaps, we're not going to fight today because he's in support of Third Army up to the north. Um, I think it could have possibly been delayed further. Yeah, because when it eventually does go ahead, only 24 hours later, um, orders are delivered verbally um down to the both divisions and both to both corps commanders and uh, when you deliver verbal orders there can be huge mistakes made i think i don't know whether it was waterloo or the Boer war i can't quite remember but there was a, a message sent um in, in one of the previous wars that said send forth the cavalry the regiment are going to advance it was sent verbally and when it actually got to where it was meant to be going, it said something like send three and four the regiment are going to dance, you know. So when you're sending verbal orders, it's a bit like Chinese whispers. They get changed uh, and throughout the as they work their way down to the recipient. Um, the Australians during that second attack have refused uh, during that second attack have refused, uh, have, have, have lost confidence in the tank. And eventually the Australians during the second Battle of Bullocor in May will fight without the tanks whatsoever. And so that morning, um, the orders have been changed slightly, not, um, not a huge amount to affect the battle, but certainly on that morning, um, the orders were changed that the infantry were to wait 15 minutes if the tanks didn't show, uh, I think 15 or 45 minutes, I can't remember off the top of my head, but then were still to go forward. Now, this wasn't taken on board, so one of the battalions actually was still waiting for the tanks when they were meant to advance. The tanks did eventually turn up, and um, they get a pretty bad rap by the um, Australians. I know there was a blue on blue. Um, one of the tanks started firing at the Australians um, and there was a few choice words, I think, um, uh, between the Australians and the British tank crews. But in the main, these guys, if a tank broke down, um, a lot of the crews would uh, get out of their tanks and join in the fighting alongside the Australians. And they get a pretty poor rap, bearing in mind um, that these things were only in their infancy. The one thing they did do was draw enemy fire, so draw enemy fire onto them. Um, artillery again wasn't used because it was believed the tanks would be vulnerable even with our own artillery fire and certainly Major Lee um, once it realised once they get in they they manage to get into the German wire and penetrate the German wire and it became, becomes a bit like Lone Pine you know uh, at Gallipoli where the Australians are rushing down these huge deep dugouts and barricading themselves in. Grenades are being thrown, lobbed back and lobbed back again if you've got the same time. Um, you know, the Australians call 19, I think something like 19 messages, 17 or 19 messages are sent back to the line to call for supporting artillery from them. Now, the forward observation officers, way back behind the line, they can see movement in Bullocor and they believe it's the Australians having got into Bullocor and linked up with the 62nd Division. And this is not true. This is the German. This is the enemy that is fighting. And so they refuse artillery fire. And really, you know, you 
whether those messages i still can't find whether i think those some of those messages must have got through must have got through but um as a forward observation officer i would be taking the word of the guys on the ground that have the situational awareness and not just what i think i can see through binoculars um so it is it is fighting totally unsupported they don't have tank support uh, they don't have artillery support so it is literally infantry on the ground and they are fighting um with flanking fire coming from their left and their right and um totally in front of them so that by 12 o'clock by lunchtime on the 11th of april um battalions are just being depleted um there are casualties lying across the battlefield prisoners uh, are being taken and um they decide to withdraw however again communication is the big issue so are the battalions on the left i think it's a 46 and 48 one of the battalions withdraws through the other without telling them what is going on so i'm pretty sure it's the 48 are left there fighting on their own not knowing that actually the battle has been cancelled and um you've got men that are literally withdrawing um through a gr ground that is now covered with uh bodies of their uh, fellow uh, fellow, fellow troops, uh, stretcher bearers are trying to get the troops off the battlefield. It's cold. You're going to be lugging your rifle, all your kit back with you. You're going to be weighed down because you're going to be wet. And there's accounts given of what, when the men withdrew from the battlefield of men that were on the side of a losing team on a football match, you know, literally totally exhausted. Um, and, and they're the, the, the first bullet call theoretically ends um they the the australians won't attack um again on mass until early may um but at, but during that time in that interval between april and may the germans will counterattack specifically against the first division at lagnicor and the first division managed to hold the line there um until eventually at the beginning of may um the australians attack again and this time it is with the second Australian division. The fourth have been taken out and the second Australian division would um, attack. But during that first attack in April, the Australians, unfortunately, it's their biggest loss um, uh, for prisoner of, from, the, from the prisoner of war perspective. The Germans take over a thousand Australian prisoners during that particular, you know, less than 24 hour attack, really. That's a, that's uh, harrowing stuff. Does, so what, Joe, what were the tactics? Like, was, was the tactics just to break in to the Hindenburg line or was it actually to take the town of Bulkor? What was the, what were the, what was the objectives? Okay, so the objective was to eventually link up with Arras in the north. And the overall tactic for this would still be using cavalry. Um, so on that first um, uh, battle, um, had had we uh, penetrated the Hindenburg line, then we were going to throw the cavalry in, in to link up with Arras in the north. But really, the overall objective is to keep the Germans fighting in the north, to stop them redeploying down on the south. Because if we were, the um, French were due to attack about four days later, and that was um, uh, on the proviso that 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 we were holding. The German army up in the north up there so, so that that was the overall objective um, the tactics we were using were still 1916 tactics but we were starting to learn I mean for me the learning the I don't like to call it the learning curve we're still making mistakes but by 1917 um, and this is early 1917 by 1917 we're beginning to learn how to use artillery we're still making mistakes and full call was one but if you look at how the Canadians attacked up in the north, um, they uh, that their their the what their use of artillery and their use of uh, tanks was entirely different. And what we have to remember sometimes it is down to divisional commanders as to how they're going to use tanks in a battle. Um, and at this stage of the war, some divisional commanders and corps commanders were taking new innovations on board, but some of them were still quite reticent about using them. So there's a difference um, between from division to division, depending quite often on what commander you've got commanding you. I just hear that, and I just, I just think of just the cost, Joe. It's just, it's unbelievable, and it's so for the for the men that were fighting on the Hindenburg was 
the was the Hindenburg line was it was it as formidable as its reputation for the troops that were on the ground? Um, yeah, I think it was. We we can't see it. There's nothing left of it in Bulgaria today, which it which frankly amazes me considering how um, how impenetrable it was meant to be. But it was literally a, a purely defensive structure, interspersed with fortified machine gun positions, dugouts, redoubts. And this thing was sort of like eight lines in depth. And when we talk about barbed wire, I always tell uh, my passengers, this is not your barbed wire that you see that bisects your farmer's fields and what have you. This is, you know, razor wire, and it's something like 10 foot deep. It is virtually impenetrable. And the only thing you are going to get through that is with eventually probably with the use of a tank, um, but use of um, high explosive. Now, when uh, the artillery, um, uh, during 1916, the, the, the kind of artillery shells we were using on the battlefield were not uh, right for destroying barbed wire. And this is something that we learn in 1917. A different type of fuse is going to be used. And we know that we need to actually, you know, destroy those outer defences before we can get into this impenetrable line. The Australians, however, would manage, and the British, would manage to get into the Hindenburg line um, during the second phase of what we know as the, as the Battle of Bulgaria. But it was a hugely defensive, a huge defensive position, yeah. So for you, Joe, why did you choose the Battle of Bulgaria? Why you? Why do you love? What do you love about it? And what makes you so interested in learning more about the Battle of uh, Bulgaria? Um, for me, it's one that's not visited as much as, say, Eep and the Song. Um, I like Eep, um, and I think we sometimes the guides we tend to get a little bit, shall we say, complacent. I like Eep, but I find Eep very commercial. So when we're going down on our, it's our Fromel and Bullcore day, um, Fromel hasn't changed a lot. You can still walk up the tracks and paths. You can put people on the positions where their forefathers stood. And Bullcore hasn't changed. It hasn't um, undergone the commerciality that possibly the Somme and Eep have. And that's why I like it. And I like it because we come up through those villages that the Australians withdrew through. So we come off the motorway a bit further down than probably some of the other guys. It's, it's funny because none of us ever guide together, so we don't quite know how we do our own specific way. But I always come off at the Bay Palm turning, and then we make our way through those villages that the Australians would have fought across until we eventually come up through Norrie. We, you would pronounce it Noriel, but it's Norai. And you can see. The ground yet there is perfect for a divisional headquarters because you're in dead ground. Uh, you can't see Bullcore from there. And then we slowly start to ascend. And we come in, pass through Narai, past a supply dump called Igri Corner, up via the central road. So that day, we are following so much in the footsteps. And then we actually take the coach off-road. Um, and uh, I've never actually done it in the winter. But it's always been good to do it in the in the spring, summertime. And then we park up on the track and the track can still be marked on the trench map. And we walk to that railway cutting. And that for me is um, a proper battlefield touring because um, you can actually, if you have an afternoon, which we never do because our schedules are so tight, but you can walk full call. But in some ways, it's easier to see from the coach because it's a re-entrant. When, so I do the whole of the kind of full course story from the railway cutting because you can see the ground, you can see the re-entry, you can point out full core, you can point out re -encore, you can point out balcony trench, ostrich trench and what have you. And then we get back on the coach and from the coach you're on that, that higher position. So we then drive to re -encore. So we look at it from the German perspective and if you look back across the ground, you can see what a killing field was. I mean, the worst possible ground you could back over. Yeah, and from what I've read, Joe, it was it was just an absolute. From every book that I've read, it's and I've obviously walked that ground myself, not with you, which I 
I hope to do in the future once this coronavirus is over. Yeah. But but it's it's just the men were just in were out in the open and just were lambs to the slaughter. By the from walking that ground, you can see, like you've said, it's a re-entrant. You can see that the men didn't stand a chance. They really didn't. It it it, it is it is very much a fiasco. And I always have to, even myself, keep reminding myself, I have to look at the bigger picture. Do you just stop and say, no, we're not going to fight? How do you do that? Um, What consequences does that have? Um, And certainly, um, I I possibly think the May battle shouldn't have gone ahead because by May, um, Field Marshal Haig was already turning his thoughts to planning an even bigger attack up in in 1917. But again, in order to keep the Germans employed, we kept attacking down in the south because we were by then planning to attack in the north. Um, So you do always have to um, keep looking at the overall context and the bigger picture, what is going on in the wider scheme of things. So certainly possibly May... um, I, I can understand why the attack happened, um, but at, at a huge cost. That's exactly right, a, a massive cost. And we'll get into that. We'll get into that in a minute. So when you walk that ground, Joes, do you feel a connection with the men of who have gone before and fought and lost their lives? Um, when I'm guiding, I don't because I'm very focused on my job when I'm guiding. And, and it's really strange when you're guiding. You seem to do it uh, without any emotion because you're focused and half your mind is thinking, okay, I've got to keep my eye on the time. We've got to be here, here and here. And and um, you're always kind of thinking about what's coming next. When I'm on my own, I do. And I have walked that ground time and time again on my own. I was there um, this March. I was out there this March uh, with a friend. Um, when we had uh, horrendously high winds and I got trapped in Eve. I couldn't get home because they stopped all the uh, um, the ferries running. Um, but when you're on your own, that's when it really hits home. And I think it hits home more that there is nothing there. You know, there's not really... If you go up to Eve, you've got, like, one of the main focuses, time pot. But at, 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 um, at Bull Court, there's not a cemetery there. Um, the cemetery that has the most Australian casualties is Kient, Kient Cemetery. But there is nothing there. And that's what I find um, emotive about it is that, you know, I'm here and uh, this hasn't changed in 100 years. Exactly right. I'll, I'll put in there as well for the listeners. It is. you. There's nothing there. And like Joe has said, it's like stepping back in time, walking the Battle of Bulkor. It really is. There's, apart from the memorial park that's there, it's how it was 100 years ago. You're exactly right, Joe. Yeah. So, um, yeah, it is my favourite one. And I think it was because it's a lesser known one that that's why I became so interested in it because um, I understand the focus behind the Somme, uh, not only for the Australians, for the British as well, the 1st of July, the worst day in the British history of the British Army. Um, Epe, I understand the call up to Epe, the Meningate, and you have to focus. But for me, Tremel and Bullcall is, um, I don't know, I don't know what it is. It's because there is, there is no commercialism there. And that, for me, is the, 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 the beauty of it. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So we move. So we'll move into the May battle. So we've we've moved away from the from the April battle now. And so the May battle. Can you tell us the the outcome of the second battle of Bull Call after the disaster of April? Can you just tell the listeners what happened in the May battle? Okay. So between um, April and May, um, the Australians were brought back behind the lines. Um, they rehearsed and they planned. Uh, by this time, they'd lost confidence in the tanks. They're not going to use the tanks. They had prepared far more with their artillery firepower. They would have a preparatory bombardment. Um, and actually, one of the accounts I read was that in one of the rehearsals, they brought out the light horse, the light horsemen, to lead the way with lighted torches to represent the creeping barrage. So they'd be using a creeping barrage, something that, again, was uh, another 
uh, um, had been first used in 1916 and now we're bringing it um, into onto the battlefield more and more and for those of you who don't know a creeping barrage is where our artillery firepower lays down fire but then moves gradually forward with the infantry following it so that means that it's keeping the Germans heads down but it's also protecting the infantry sounds a very easy thing to do but it's very very difficult when you're on the ground and there are numerous cases of our own troops running into their own artillery uh, firepower uh, so early May it will be the second Australian division uh, using two brigades, the 6th Brigade commanded by a guy called Gellibrand and the 5th Brigade uh, commanded by a guy called Smith. Now I like Gellibrand, he's one of my, he's one of my, I, I, I like him, he, he, he's uh, um, been uh, trained uh, at Santa with a, a lot of the contemporaries that he would uh, uh, would be part of this battle, he knew Goth at Santa for example. But um, there's two very different schools of thought with our two brigade commanders, so Gellibrand decides to position his brigade headquarters up on the railway cutting so that he has situational awareness he knows what's going on on the ground and he decides that his his uh, a massive machine gun fire is going to fire into bullcourt uh, to his left hopefully keeping the german heads down now on the other hand smith has his brigade headquarters some 2300 yards back still at noriel so has no real idea of what's going on the ground on the ground now there's two schools of thought with regard to this Gellibrand is a brigade commander and really if he gets hit and killed you lose your chain of command so you could say was he right in doing that was he not right he took the risk um and there's a bit i always read out because Gellibrand is up there um and when they go into attack he is literally shoving every chief cook and bottle washer into the fray however smith's brigade to his right they virtually don't get off their start lines Gellibrand, being up there realizes this and he sends one of his officers a guy called major gilchrist he, and he virtually sort of like boots him and says get those guys moving otherwise our flank is exposed our right hand flank so gilchrist gets up there and uh, he manages to get um the fifth brigade moving but he's subsequently lost in the attack he's never seen again and one of the quotes i always read about Gellibrand, um and if you don't mind i'm going to read it to you yeah now. absolutely I, I, I read it it says uh, the fighting is terrible men fought until they dropped some badly wounded propped themselves into position and carried on fighting before long we extended our foothold and success rested on the knowledge that the small isolated groups, many without leaders, would fight on. One only remembers from the blur of fighting when one's head was dizzy, gallant men firing rifles until the barrels were hot and throwing bombs until their arms were numb. Time seemed without night, time seemed to be lost. We appeared to have reached an eternity of day without night. On that day, every man was a hero, Lloyd as CO used a rifle as never before. Lieutenant Reg Pickett, leader of a bomb party, still throwing bombs though shot through the right arm. And above all, our brigadier, our beloved John Gellibrand, organizing cooks, clerks, and batmen to rally to our assistance. Now Gellibrand's brigade during that attack ran up 1600 casualties. They are brought out of the line um, and the first division um, take over. And there's the first division, there are accounts of these men because the, the battlefield is littered with the dead and dying. And there are accounts of the men as they come up onto the battlefield are more concerned about stepping on the dead and the wounded than they are about any German um, enemy uh, that is fighting. But they go into the fray, they get into, um, and this is the 4th of May now, so, so only a few days after that first attack. Um, what they're trying to do is link up with the British who are fighting desperately through the town of Bullcourt. Bullcourt itself by now is just a ruin. There is no church steeple that we see today. There's bombed out bits of houses. But the Germans, for the Germans, this is like a rabbit warren um, because of these deep dugouts. So every time they are popping up and effectively cutting off the Australians uh, meeting up with the British to the left. Um, 
And if you can imagine it, um, as the Australians are trying to get forward, not only have you got your fighting troops, you've got your stretcher bearers taking the men uh, off the battlefield. You've got men bringing up supplies. You've got other men frantically digging communication trenches. So it's not just the fighting troops. Men are being buried and then buried again under almost constant artillery fire. And um, there was a guy, I can't remember his name now, but he survived the Battle of Bullcourt. And he'd been digging, trying to dig one of the communication trenches uh, and noticed the colour patch on one of these the, the dead, one of these corpses, bodies, he was digging it. And he said, oh, that, that's my brother's battalion. Uh, and turning this dead guy over realised it, it, just by pure coincidence, it was his own brother. Oh, so wow. just the horrendous, uh, and, uh, and, and it's not only the physical fatigue, it is the mental fatigue as well. You know, some of these men said, like, full call was just hell on earth. And that's one of the things we find as guides is to actually make people understand you're standing in a beautiful field. It's green, it's April, the birds are singing. To try and put into words that picture is very, very difficult. It's one of the things um, that I find most difficult um, of this battle. Uh, the first division will eventually be pulled out of the line uh, and the 5th Division will be pulled in and 5th Division will be the last division that will rotate through full call. Joe, that's that's harrowing stuff. Like I, when you read that account, I had hairs standing on the back of my neck. Like that is just, it's just, it makes you. It almost, I'm almost shedding a tear hearing that. Like it is just, it's an, it's so emotional. And it, it, yeah, you. I, that's why I love walking these battlefields, and that's why I'm so passionate about it because it's it's the personal stories, it's the personal connections, and the pers personal accounts. That that's that's what makes me study the First World War. I, I just love it, and I know for you, you feel very similar. It's, it's it's the same for you and all the guides who work for Matt McLaughlin Battlefield Tours. I, I I know that in from just talking to all of you, I know that you agree. Yeah, I do most definitely, and the the the, the personal stories are um, what bring it to life. We can talk about tactics, strategy, and what division was here and what division there. But the personal stories are really um, great stories. So I use one memoir I use, which is my go-to memoir for um, the, the whole of the First World War is one written by a guy called Walter Downing to the last ridge. And Walter Downing has a great story because he tried to enlist, I think, about nine times. And uh, this is a true story. And a nurse verified it for me before. He, in, he enlisted, he, was, he, he wasn't tall enough. So on this ninth time, he had gone round to and try, tied weights to his ankles and hung himself from a bar or something, then rushed round to the enlistment office before he could regain his normal height and, and, and joined the military. But he was part of 5th Division, Walter Downing. So he witnessed from L. Um, he survived the war, obviously, to write his memoir, but he was at full core and he writes so eloquently. So I use a lot of his words. Um, so when the 5th Division would be take their positions up on the battlefield, Walter Downing would be part of that uh, battle, as would Sergeant Simon Fraser, who is uh, Don't Leave Me Cobber fame, the, the big Sergeant Simon Fraser who yes. went out from Mel. Yep. Yep. Um, but he would unfortunately lose his life at um, Bullcourt. Bullcourt also has um, one of my, possibly my favourite, I can't say, favourite and beauty and all those words I find quite hard to say, but, but one of the VC actions that really inspires me, and that is the VC action of Lieutenant Rupert Moon. Uh, now, Rupert Moon was part of um, Pompey Elliott's brigade, Pompey Elliott, Harold Elliott, you'll all know, uh, 15th Brigade Commander. And when he enlisted, he was kind of a specky Joe 90 bank clerk from, uh, I think he was from Victoria, I'm not sure, so please don't, uh, please correct me if I'm wrong on that. But um, Pompey Elliott didn't ever think he would make a leader of men, a good officer and what have you. And uh, one of the uh, orders he's, he's, he's given is to take a machine gun position at uh, what was known as the Six Crossroads and together with two other lieutenants, Lieutenant Pelton and Lieutenant Top, he would, um, this was his objective, 
their objectives, once he'd achieved what he'd set out to do, um, he was to help the other two officers. So he goes in with his men um, and he takes a, uh, take, manages to take the machine gun post in a bomb fight, but he gets wounded in the shoulder. Um, he goes on to help with the second objective uh, and he receives the second wound and this hits him in the shoulder. He spins round, he's dazed. Um, he carries on, continues to defend his position and takes a third wound, I think it's in the foot. Um, and by now, if you can imagine him, it's May time, he's sweating, he's got blood all over him, and he's still there. The adrenaline is pumping through his veins, and he turns around to his men and says something like, I've got three wounds, boys, and not one of them even good enough for a blighty. A blighty wound, which would get him back to the UK, he would survive, but get him back to the UK. He continues to defend this position until eventually he does receive a blighty wound, and uh, the bullet goes through his cheek, takes out 12 of his teeth and comes out the other side. And he continues to defend his position until he makes sure everything is in proper uh, defensive order and then gets himself taken away as a casualty. This scrawny, specky bank clerk from wherever in Australia. <laughs> well, <I'd take> so, um, <laughs> It sounds typical, Joe, of the the Australian larrikin just that coming to the coming to the forum, you know, like yeah, just oh, she'll be right, mate, you know, just the just the attitude of you know sh she'll be right, just yeah, I've got three wounds, but it's okay, I'll keep going, and yeah, but yeah, yeah abs absolutely. So of the he survived the war. Wow, what a what a story! What what an yeah. absolute what a what a story! So we so we get to so the, we, the the May battle's coming to an end. So did we did we get to OG one OG two? Did we get through those trenches and did we eventually go into? Did we break through into Bull Corps or what? What happened? We did. We did. So we, we did take Borkor, we linked up with the British, who also, uh, during what well, I've, I've been focusing on the Australians, because this is for an Australian audience, but also the, the British went through uh, 62nd Division, 7th Division, and then uh, 58th Division. So they went through three divisions as well, uh, with a huge, huge loss, but we did link up with the British. But eventually, the Germans would just withdraw from their front line. And by now, by the end of May, beginning of June, all eyes are turning on to Ypres because up in the north, Plumer is uh, uh, planning his successful attack on the Messines Ridge, which would be the precursory attack prior to the Third Battle of Ypres or Passchendaele, as we know. But effectively, like the Somme um, uh, and, and like Verdun, this battle just petered out in the spring coming to summer of um of 1917 um the accounts by now there are a lot when i was certainly was when i was doing my ma um i was shocked at birdwood believing this had been a success and there are accounts and diary entries written by the australians uh how uh, uh, of their sort of like turning against birdwood in himself for having put them through this the fourth australian division would be withdrawn from the fifth division, uh, from the sorry, from from the fourth from the fifth army, and would eventually go up to Messines to fight. Only a month later, and by all accounts, their preference was to do that than to stay with Goff's fifth army. What was the cost of the two battles, Joe? What was the cost to the AIF? In round figures, ten thousand. Wow, ten and and over a thousand men taken prisoner, like. Wow. Yeah, over a thousand. It was the biggest um, capture by the Germans of the AI throughout the war. Wow, that's just wow. Ten thousand in virtually eight weeks. Ten thousand yeah. men killed in eight yeah. weeks. Just yeah. unbelievable, unbelievable. That is just wow. Just the numbers are, are shocking. So obviously, Joe, when when we've studied this battle and you've studied it a lot. So should the blame be put on Goff or should it be put on the Australian generals? What's the, what, in your opinion, what do you think? I don't think, this is my opinion, it falls on any one person. I think it falls on Goff, certainly Birdwood, um, the staff work. But from the Australian, I'm not talking about the British perspective here, from the Australian, a lot of the staff work was inept. Uh, the failure to understand that you can't use just 
uh, troops and infantry, uh, tr infantry and tanks alone. But again, we're learning. And the thing is, what you also have to bear in mind, you know, when the tanks first went out on the battlefield, we have to learn on the job because time is not on our side. It's not like today where our infantry troops can go and train for an exercise, uh, or go on exercise and train for their next war or what have you. These are guys that are learning on the job. And in order to, for them to learn, you have to take them out of the line. And we just don't have the time. It's playing catch up all the time. Um, and also, don't forget that you still have troops that are inexperienced because you have reinforcements coming onto the battlefield the whole time. So in my opinion, it's circumstances, situation, ineptitude of leadership. Uh, certainly Goff does have to have, does, I, in my opinion, have to take a large part of the blame for this. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. I agree. I think I think you're right. And I think also, too, we should say to the listeners that most Australians don't like to see their generals be blamed. And it was always, and in every account you hear, Joe, it was always the British that sent us to the slaughter. They were happy to do it. But I, I think that a Birdwood should take some blame as well. I really, I be, that's my opinion. I think he, I think he deserves some blame as well. It shouldn't just be Goff. I agree that Goff does deserve some blame, but I agree also that Bird would deserve some as well. I, I think he could have stood up and said, no, this attack, in, my, in his opinion, shouldn't go ahead. So that's, that's my, it may sound controversial to, to my listeners, but I, I've, I've read the accounts, Joe, you've read the accounts, and yeah, Birdwood does have to have some blame here. Yeah, sure. I agree. I mean, I, it's always a bit of a challenge when you're a, when you're a pom taking a coach load of Australians <laughs> to the Western Front. Yes. Um, but I I put it I I try and put it into context in that everywhere we go, even today, if you work in a big corporate system, you have good managers and bad managers, and some of those managers will learn, and some of them won't, and some of them will get sacked, and some of them will do really well. It's no different with the army be they british or australian or what have you so i try and um i try and put as an unbiased opinion as i can uh, and that's the way i look at it i absolutely agree with that and i think joe you do a great job in that because you aren't biased you know you you do put blame onto golf and there's there's certain guides that don't they won't put any blame on anyone. And it's, I, I think you do a great job. I really do. I, I think that's unbiased and I think you've, you've answered it really well. Thank you. <laughs> so to, so you take Australians, obviously, well, at the moment with the coronavirus, it, it's sort of st it stopped the world pretty much. When you do take Australians to the battlefield, what can be seen today in the town of Bullcourt? What, what actually is there for people if they walk this battlefield? What, what is there in, in Bullcourt that they can actually see? Okay, so you can still see the old railway cutting. And I use a lot of, when I go out on the battlefield, I use a lot of then and now photographs. So I've got a photograph of the railway cutting. And when we stood there, I'll take the, the uh, photograph out and go, that's what it was like in 1917. This is exactly the same place today. Same with Igri Corner. Um, when we get back on the coach, as I say to you, we go into Reincor. Now, all these little villages, have re-established themselves so actually on the battlefield there's not a lot to see we sometimes if there's a huge amount out through the winter when the uh, farmers have been plowing up their fields they call it the iron harvest and certainly at Borkor you can almost guarantee to see something because it's not where most tourists go very rarely now you see stuff uh, on the tourist route around Ypres and the Somme you will do in the winter um, but Borkor there's a corner um, just by the sunken road where the farmers will stash like stuff that they churned up on their own um, from their tractors when they've been plowing so we always do a pit stop there with a verbal warning don't touch anything anyone <laughs> um, and there's usually a couple of shells or a couple of grenades there and then we head into Reincor so we look at it from the Germans perspective we then go left through Reincor and we come back into the actual village itself because the village itself the center of the village was a British objective. It was never the, the, the Australians were always to the uh, right of that village. 
And on the way in, you can stop at a lovely local little memorial that has been put up by the locals to the Australians, mainly the Australians. Strangely, the British, you don't get many British tourists come down to, or British battlefield uh, tourists come back, come down to Bullcore. Their main focus is on the Somme and Eat. Um, so we hardly any see any Brits. So the focus at Bullcore is very, very much, uh, I call it Anzac plastic. So very for the Anzacs. Um, and then we come into the, as we come into the village on the left, sitting directly on what would have been the old Hindenburg line. You have that marvellous uh, Peter Corlett's digger memorial, same guy that did the sculpture at Ramel's. And there I use, uh, from, from where he stands, it's quite difficult to see the battlefield, so I always use him um, to describe the fighting order of an Australian on the Western Front, what they would be carrying, you know, the, the amount of weight they'd been carrying, and the different types of kit and equipment. We then all get back on the coach um, and then we come into Bullcore, the village itself, which is a tiny little community. The church is there um, and just in front of the church, you see what I think is what I like. It. It's a unique memorial. It's the slouch hat. And I love that because it's not it's not imposing. It's just a nice little touch. And then normally if we've got time, if we have time, which and if it is open, we try and get a, a beer in the Canberra pub. Yes, uh, I must mention too, Joe, that there's a there's a little museum just around the corner from the pub, yeah. and I've I've been to that museum, and it's a great. It was built and run by a local man who lived in Bullcore, yeah. and it it is a. Unfortunately, they did some renovations, and he 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 passed away before it was actually finished. So it was it was a shame that he couldn't see his his work that he. That he'd put together and but it's as i say joe it's it's one of my favorite battlefields as well i really do love the battle of, of bullcore because it's as you said it's a very australian battlefield it really is mm. I, I i agree 100 with you it, it's one of those battle it's very much plays a sister role to posiers it, it really does it, but it's another it's a it's a battlefield that is very much to be in the hearts of, of all australians because it's such an amazing battlefield and, and i 100 percent agree with you that i think more australians should go and, and visit the battle of, of bullcore because for that reason, it's such an amazing battlefield. Yeah, I totally agree with you, there, Adam. <laughs> so I read in an account in a from from the battle that Bullcore was a was a battle that is taught now of a battle like in future battles of what not to do. Do you agree with that? Oh God, yeah, yeah. This is this is how to not. Yeah, uh, just the ground. I mean, future battles uh, uh, prior to Bullcore. Uh, a re-entrant has always been looked upon um, tactically as the worst type of ground you can fight across. So there's your starter. Um, yeah, so it should, it should it is, and I, I think that's the thing we do with battlefield guiding. We tend not to, um, you know, our successful battles, we tend to go, oh yeah, that was successful, whatever. And the ones where everything went absolutely pear-shaped, we're all sort of like, well, why did it go wrong? Where did it go wrong? Because it creates debate, and it, and and uh, uh, whereas the ones were successful, such as Le Hamel, you can tell the successes and how uh, rigorously uh, Monash made sure that everything was in place and what have you. But um, it doesn't create the debate that a disaster creates. In Britain, we love our disasters. <laughs> yes, no, you you certainly do. You certainly do. That's that's for sure. So I, I should actually ask Joe. I, I should have asked it earlier, and I'll, I'm going off topic a little bit. How did you become a battlefield guide? So how did you get into into battlefield and becoming a battlefield guide? Okay, well, um, my dad uh, was a uh, veteran of the Second World War, so I was brought up on all these stories. Um, and to cut a very long story short, I did 18 years in the reserve forces as uh, signals, and everywhere um, I was posted, I organised the battlefield tour with the same company. And eventually, I ended up working for them when I was living in Germany, um, covering Operation Market Garden, so Second World War. Um, then um, came back to England and somebody uh, recommended me to a schools company 
um, and then I was recommended to work for initially before uh, I worked for Matt, I worked for Albatross, um, but then went over to work for Matt, um, joined the Guild of Battlefield Guides, and what became a, what was a interest became a hobby, became a passion, became an obsession, became my job. So that's it in a nutshell. <laughs> It's a well, Joe. It's a, it's a great passion to have. That as I've heard you say before, if you won the lottery tomorrow, you would still do your job, but you'd do it for free. And I, yeah, I think we're all in agreement that we, the people, especially the likes of Matt, Pete Smith, all the battlefield guides, and myself being, I'm not a battlefield guide, but I am passionate about the First World War. It's the best thing in the world to you know have a passion for because there's so many things that. The First World War, it, it changed so much in the course of four years. There, there was so many technological advances, the tactics, everything changed. In, and people, people's perspective of, of the First World War is they, the men, troops would jump from lever trench, they'd blow the whistle and they'd march into machine gun fire and they would just they would just run to their death. But that was the tactics in 1914. But tactics had changed and by 1918, the war had moved on from that. Yeah, I, I would agree with you. By 1918, you know, you see the uh, British Army, and I include the Australians, Canadians, Empire, Dominion troops, um, from 1914 to what they were still fighting outdated tactics till to 1918 using combined warfare, air power, firepower, um, uh, armour, and infantry in combined warfare and and i always use the analogy bear with me if you will on this yeah, one no, absolutely so a supermarket so let's let's for example take woolworths okay because woolworths i know is big as in australia <laughs> yes. now uh woolworths starts off as a little corner shop and that's how most supermarkets start off and then a couple of years later because uh, it gets so popular another corner shop opens and then another one a couple of years later and they need transport to link their supplies and what have you between all those corner shops. And then they say, okay, right, we're going to make a bigger shop. And so it progresses. So 100 years later, Woolworths, with all that logistics, with all those managers, with all those uh, shop workers, equate them to your infantry, uh, with all that supplies, is now the huge corporate conglomerate that it is. Well, the British Expeditionary Force, took four years to do that so that's nothing short of extraordinary so i always use that analogy with the supermarket if that makes sense it, it does it does it, it's a great analogy because you're right in four short years we advanced so so much in in four short years and it took like you said the supermarkets take a hundred years to achieve what they're achieving now we did and during the first world war uh, it took four short years. Like that's yeah. that's amazing, absolutely amazing. So, for you, Joe, what what's your favourite part of being a battlefield guide? Um, I think I've said said this before. Um, first of all, I think imparting my knowledge, um, and secondly, I I really enjoy it when we where that special moment when we take people on pilgrimages because they are so emotional and and, and you just feel that well for me I just feel I've done something special today because Matt McLaughlin's guides do the research as well so our passengers don't just come on board and get taken to a great headstone we I certainly I um, do a lot of research behind where they enlisted where they came from what battalion they were in um, and if we can with a lot of them if we go into the war diaries a lot of the time we can find out where that person was killed prior to being where they are in the cemetery. So that's a, an added thing that, uh, that the Matt McLaughlin guides do. But that's special. I've taken so many people over the years to visit their relatives. And I, I think that is, that's the whole point of what we do, what we do. Absolutely, absolutely. So to sum up, Joe, the, for the men that, were, that fought at Bull Corps and were lucky enough to survive, what what happened to those men after after Bull Corps? So where what were they pulled out of the line or for arrest or what what actually happened in in summary? Uh, yeah, they would have been pulled out of the line for the, uh, arrest. Um, as I said, Fourth Division um, went up to fight, would be fighting again 
um, alongside third division um, at during the Battle of Messines, less than really just about um, less than a month later, or just about a month later. Um, but the the rest would have been um, pulled out of the line. There would have been an element of reorganisation, reinforcements undertaken, um, and then the majority of them would then see fighting later on in the year in 1917 during the Third Battle of Ypres, which first, second, fifth. Australian Division, 3rd and 4th, all of them took part in. So they would have been withdrawn. You know, you would still have your daily routine um, going in and out of the line, um, even in, in quiet places, you know, when they're pulled out, you're pulled back for a bit of R&R &R where they'd undertake sports and, you know, you'd have footy matches and what have you. Um, you'd have your normal training would, would go on. But then they would do that. They would go back up the line, do their normal stint, be put into support trenches, then reserve, taken out again, and prepared for what was going to be happening in the north in the summer, going into winter of 1917. Unfortunately, as you say, Joe, it, the fighting didn't stop. The the AIF would, would continue on after the terrible losses of Bulcor. Like we say, Joe, it, the war is a costly business and it doesn't stop just because of, uh, of a terrible battle. It, it continues on. So it's a great way to summarise that. That's why I wanted to get you on, Joe, because it's a battle that it's, it's probably not as well known as what it should be. And I'm just so grateful that we could, we could get you on and, and have a chat about it. And so, Joe, because you're not, because you're not guiding at the moment, what what are you working on at the moment? What are you, what are you keeping yourself busy? How are you keeping yourself busy? I'm doing a lot of reading. Um, so at the moment, I'm reading about the completely different, not World War One at all, uh, Second World War, about the Eighth Air Force. So the um, United States Air Force, uh, just up the road from me, was the Hundred Bomb Group Airfield, and they were known as the Bloody One Hundred in the Second World War. Um, yeah, doing a lot of reading, watching a lot of rubbish TV, <laughs> eating and drinking too much, <laughs> and, missing, and missing my guiding. Absolutely. So uh, it may, mainly reading. Yeah, I know I know how much guiding means to you and all the the guides that aren't able to do what you love doing and it's it's a shame but I, I do believe Joe that it will it will it will bounce back I I, I believe and I, I'll definitely be getting um, when this when this is all over I'll, I'll definitely be coming back over and I, I'd love to walk the ground with you it's it's something that's in the in the plans of, of the future for me so I, I definitely want to walk the ground with you and Joe, we've we've spoken for over an hour, and I mean, it's it's probably we probably could have spoken for three or four hours. It's been absolutely terrific to to get you on the show and and talk about you know Bullcore, and and I do appreciate that you've given me over an hour of your time. And but Joe, I I can't thank you enough, and we will definitely get you back on the show because I I'd like to get uh, I'd like to get you on and talk about your World War Two studies. That's that's uh, okay. that's, that's something okay. for the for the future. And but Joe. I'd, I'd just like to say thank you very much. It's been it's been terrific. Thanks, Adam. <laughs>